Okay, I believe that means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, thanks so much for joining us. That's another episode of the SGGQA podcast. I am Juan Carlos Bagnell, some gadget guy, the SGG of the SGGQA podcast. That's some gadget guy. Uh, the QA stands for question and answer, as uh, this is an interactive live stream that we turn into an audio podcast. I like to get that interaction. I like to get conversations going. And uh, this is uh, this is sort of my labor of love. I-, I think we all can spend a little bit more time with news, with tech topics, sort of sorting out how we feel about those tech topics and sharing those as a discussion. That's why I do my show on a Monday, is it gives us the weekend to kind of recover and recoup. And uh, this is already shaping up to be a crazy, awesome, interactive live stream. Uh, I'm seeing uh, people all over both Twitch and YouTube, Mimranglot, Mimranglot on Twitch, Q3 Becker, uh, Aditya Anil, Philip Morales, Tech Rant. Abraham, Artemis, uh, Sherrill, I'm seeing Yolanda, LFA, uh, LFA, you got to look out for LFA because he's a moderator now and uh, he will ban hammer you. And I told him he could ban hammer you. So just just be careful. And before we even got started, a trio of shout outs from Aman, Junkie and Daniel Barakat uh, for some uh, super chats right off the top. Uh, again, uh, as I always like to say, uh, you can troll me and that, that really won't mess up my podcast much. But if, um, if you're really nice to me during a live stream, then, then yeah, that distracts me more than anything else. So, uh, <laughs> what's up everybody? I hope you all had a fantastic weekend. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water right now. TK Bay is in the live chat also. Again, I think this is going to be a fun discussion. We're a little news light, but we've got a lot of hardware to talk about. So I think that's going to be a fun con- uh, conversation. Uh, I want to jump right into some housekeeping. And uh, let, let's let's go ahead and get started there. Uh, first of all, again, the, uh, the constant reminder throughout the entire month of May that the live stream of this podcast will be moving over to Twitch in June. So we're live streaming on YouTube throughout the month of May, and I'm just warning you that come, I think it's the second Monday of June, we're going to switch over to Twitch as the main live stream, and then we're, we'll upload the podcast to YouTube after the fact. So if you want to be a part of that uh, QA, you want to be a part of the interactive part of this podcast, then be looking for twitch.tv slash some gadget guy. Uh, that's where the live feed is going to go. Another super chat coming in from Yolanda Rowe. Cup of coffee or a kick to the SGG satellite fund. Uh, that, that's another thing I just want to preface right at the top. Um, we've been having a number of problems with the live stream. My upload speeds are still all over the place. So I hope that this hangs for uh, for this podcast and that I don't go to uh, slideshow mode for those of you watching the live stream. Uh, but we were joking about you know funding a satellite so that I'd have my own dedicated internet connection. The other thing that might be a bit of a problem is this morning I was editing a video and this most recent Windows update has been blue screening like crazy. So I think I've got everything up. I think everything is working. But I, I apologize in advance if I go to click on a tab in my browser and then the entire stream just disappears because uh, it has been horrifically unpredictable what will cause my super awesome mega powerful workstation to just totally crash. So thanks, Microsoft. And thanks, Spectrum, for giving me the shakiest platform to try and do a live stream from. Okay. Whew. Um, Steve DeRoach, that's a, $5 is an uppity coffee. What? That's not, that's not, well, okay. First of all, I live in Los Angeles, so $5 is like a regular cup of coffee. Um, so there you go. (laughs) Philip Morales, only reason why I'm not on Mixer is to hopefully prevent a 10 frame per second one. (laughs) If you want to watch me on Mixer, you can watch me on Mixer. I I don't think that's gonna, that's gonna tag, um, my performance too bad. Again, I'm I'm not directly uploading to Mixer. I'm going through Restream, so it shouldn't be too bad. Concept Creator with a super chat. Also a bit towards my satellite fund. And Jay Perkins, I'm going to give you this while I still can. 
<laughs> before the stream dies. I love it. Okay, so we've got housekeeping to cover. We've got a couple, a handful of news topics. And then I want to spend a little bit more time than we usually do at the, the second half of this podcast talking about smartphones, hardware. I've been living out of the Google Pixel 3a. I have another super low budget phone to talk about, um, just to sort of a first impressions on what the entry level of the market looks like. So I, I think we're going to have a lot of fun to uh, to 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 get into. I, I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. So uh, topics, housekeeping. First of all, yesterday here in the United States was Mother's Day. And if you are, you know, sort of uh, close to family members or mother figures in your life, I hope that you are able to do something, you know, uh, have a conversation or share a meal with someone that you care about or someone who cares about you. That's pretty much my go-to for any holiday idea is, I mean, for as much as we try and make it all about spending money and buying gifts and, and showing through commerce, like how much we care about people, I, I'm very much of the school of it's the thought that counts. And so maybe you had a video call uh, with someone you care about. Or you know, like I said, for me, it's all about breaking bread. If you have a meal with someone, that's that's like that's that's the most important thing you can share with someone is food. I have a problem with food. Um, but, you know, uh, just to kind of take it back, uh, I'm going to go back into screen share. I'm going to go into screen share here for just a second. I was super fortunate that I was able to uh, work with my mom on a Mother's Day project. And so uh, we flew her out here to Southern California and she did a video with us at Newegg where we did a Tetris showdown. And uh, during that showdown, uh, I, I just said we had microphones running. So I was just asking her questions about her, her history and her background in technology and uh, computer science. And so I, I thankfully the Newegg Ninjas were able to capture all of that audio and we put it together into a little half hour podcast. And uh, I'm excited to share that with you because I, I get all of this from my mom and my dad. Um, I really didn't understand how unique our family was when it came to uh, being ahead of the curve for technology and for networking. Um, we had a 2400 baud modem uh, connected to uh, a university and to uh, military servers before the internet was ever a thing, uh, before ARPANET was really a thing for consumers that they could, uh, they could log into. And so, uh, you know, it, it's exciting that for all of my geekery and for, you know, how much we're into this kind of stuff, if you're watching this podcast and you're probably a fan of, of technology or probably an, an enthusiast too, but generationally now we're getting into um, these kinds of conversations and, and, and also like, you know, from my, from my parents' generation perspective, we're both on those cusps, right? She's she's not really a baby baby boomer, and she's just a little too old to be like Generation X. I'm not quite Generation X, but I'm also a little too old to be a millennial, you know. So we both of our times got to be sort of transitionary generations into a new world of of entertainment and a new world of multimedia. And, uh, you know, she's getting to do things I never would have dreamed of when I was a kid in interacting with my daughter, interacting with her granddaughter. And again, video calls, sharing high quality video, photos and playing games and the ability to play games like she'll she'll be able to play games with my daughter online in a way that I wish I could have done with my grandmother back in the day. So, um uh, yeah, there's a half hour conversation. It's not a super long podcast. Again, we were sort of in between shooting parts of a video. So, it, I mean, some of the conversation feels a little disjointed. I just stapled it all together. But I hope you give it a listen because uh, she also gets to share some really fun insights. You know, she was a computer programmer during the mom pa bell days of telephony. And, uh, you know, she she lived through divestiture where we broke up AT&T, you know, <laughs> like um, it, it's the, I, I what I need to do is is like create like a whole podcast series of talking to her about that kind of stuff because she remembers when you know calling card services were a thing and and we lived through having to have a special dial-in code for sprint you know i uh, we, we we look at things like t-mobile and sprint merging and we forget that competition was actually a really important um benefit was a was really important for consumers back when AT&T was sort of the only service that you could have and the things that we take for granted today, you know, having uh, the companies vying for our dollars, we we don't want to lose that. So anyway, um, 
you can uh, you can catch that. That's on somegadgetguy.com if you're subscribed to the audio feed of the podcast. There, there isn't a video version of that podcast, but um, you can catch that half hour on Patreon and on uh, somegadgetguy.com or subscribe. You can subscribe to the audio feed if you if you like to listen to audio podcasts. Then, um, speaking of audio, um, hold on. Let me cue up my next two. Uh, just uh, two quick tags. I am, I'm finally spending some time with a Galaxy, a uh, Galaxy S10e, but uh, before the end of last week, I had some time to record my samples and do some listening, and so for both the Pixel 3a and the Galaxy S10e, I have my audio reviews out, and so uh, you want to know about headphone performance, if you want to hear some speaker samples and some speaker comparisons. Those videos are now live on the Patreon. Uh, those are Patreon exclusives. We do the full deep dive. I show my graphs. I show my charts. You can see how uh, the quality, the signal-to-noise ratio, noise floor, um, EQ, all of that plays into the headphone strategies and just how excited I am on the Pixel 3a that we've got a headphone jack again on a $400 phone. So those are live. Both of those are live. And uh, just so you know... I'm in the middle of doing all of my camera shoots. Uh, the end of last week was tough because uh, in, in it's not very often that we get multiple days of hazy, foggy, cloudy weather in Southern California. So I, I held off to for shooting on, a, on the Pixel 3a and on the Galaxy S10e because I'm shooting both at the same time. And that's tough. Uh, but I held off because I didn't want a majority of the photos to be in lighting conditions that are different than how I normally test these smartphones. But, you know, shooting two phones at the same time is, it, you would think it's, well, that's just twice as much work. Every single setup is now take a burst of photos in standard, take a burst of photos in HDR, get a couple photo raw files that you can use as examples, shoot some video, trade phone. Then on the S10e, Burst of photos, uh, normal field of view in auto, wide field of view in auto, HDR, normal field of view, HDR, wide. Pro mode, thankfully I can't shoot wide in the pro mode, which is dumb, um, but get a couple samples of the normal uh, you know, sort of pro mode so I can get a raw. Then do some sort of fancy AI mode, then shoot some video. Occasionally shoot video in both 60 frame per second and 30 frame per second and get samples of the sort of uh, image stabilization and then move on to my next <laughs> setup. <sighs> okay, so um, that's tough. <laughs> that's a lot of work. It's a lot to keep straight. I, this is why I don't do a lot of camera comparisons is because uh, I don't like rushing well, here's a couple of photos here and a couple photos there. I need to be able to point to the differences and say, like, well, this is what the camera is doing in standard mode. This is what the camera is doing in HDR. Here's what the AI mode is doing. So why these things are different. That's why my camera reviews are often a half hour long. Um, but uh, th those will be coming soon-ish. I'm probably going to finish the Pixel 3a first because no one really seems to care about Galaxy coverage any anymore. Um I'm just adding it because I feel like I need to have a Samsung on my list, and I didn't cover Samsung at all last year. And I'm probably not going to spend any, if uh, much, if any time with the Note. I'm just not really, I, unless something crazy comes from that camera, and I can find a way to get my hands on one. But right now, the Pixel 3a is an exciting conversation because nothing is really slowing that phone down. Um, if anything, I'm frustrated that the Pixel 3a... I, We'll cover more, but just in, as a tease, I'm frustrated the Pixel 3a hides the HDR setting. Like, you have to go into the settings and enable control over HDR, HDR Plus, and HDR Super Plus, whatever they call it. Because if you disable all of that, you, got, you get back to that rapid burst, super, uh, what do you call that? Super responsive shutter. You know, if you remember the first time you picked up a Nexus and you went and hit the zero lag shutter and it just went pop. And you got that photo, and the photo captured so fast that you could actually blur it if you weren't holding steady. That's how fast the zero lag shutter was. If you get out of the HDR processing on the Pixel, you get back to that pop, 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 where it's not a burst mode. It's just as responsive. It's as fast as you can hit the shutter. And I love that feel. And I'm 
crazy excited about that feel at $400. So I'm going to have a lot to say about the camera performance, but right now, just to kind of wet your whistle there, uh, audio reviews for both, um, and we're talking stereo speakers, headphone jacks, uh, graphs, charts, comparisons, it's all there. Patreon.com slash some gadget guy. You can you can go deep dive on the audio kit there and and I'm super excited to be uh to be playing with that stuff again. So uh let me get a sip here. <laughs> From Huara Samir. The S10 is already the bestest phone though. <laughs> Of course. I mean, there's no reason to buy any other device but an S10e, right? I mean, so if you care about headphone performance, well, I mean, you don't because no one cares about headphone performance. If you care about having any kind of advanced capabilities for the wide angle shooter, why would anyone care about that? If you want, I, you know, we, we can talk about air gestures, gimmicks, but why take why take a phone and, and not have reverse wireless charging on the Galaxy with the smallest battery of the Galaxy S series line? I mean, that's got to be super handy, right? Uh, so ah, let me just get my feet down here. OK, so, um, yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping I'm going to have. I, I mean, I keep saying this, but there are a bunch of videos coming out uh, that we'll talk about at the end of the podcast. So uh, we'll, we'll do a little wrap up as we get to the end here. But I do want to jump into some news. We do have a little a little politics for me to soapbox about because everything that I say almost always turns out to be true. Uh, so we we want we want to be ahead of the curve and we want to be resources for uh, for the those of us uh, those those of our family and friends so that we can offer up good advice. We need to know what's going on around us. So. Ah, let me uh, jump into screen share here again. Oh, Yolanda Rowe. I can't watch any more headphone or earbud reviews. Hashtag wallet. <laughs> well, I mean, just don't worry about that. But, you know, if you want to know how different phones perform and, and more than just it has a headphone jack, which is good. Um, you know, I, even just an amp comparison can be really handy. If you care about what you feed your ears, then you should know. And again, you can still make an informed purchasing decision to get something that performs less good, like a Galaxy. Um, but if, if you do that, you'd want to know that you'd probably need to pick up some additional hardware or use a standalone DAP or go to Bluetooth uh, for that headphone performance. Because, you know, why spend seven, eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars on a phone if it can't power decent headphones? I'm just saying. You would think that that would come up more frequently in reviews. And it doesn't. So I guess that's one of those niche conversations that only those of us who follow, you know, this little circle of tech conversationalists can can get into can get into. <laughs> Yolanda, again, the audio addiction is nearly as bad as a, phot a photographic addi ad addiction. I, I thankfully I'm sort of, you know, on on a twelve step program from buying lenses for cameras, uh, Samsung actually helped kill that while I was messing around with the NX line. Um, now I've become super practical um, when it comes to video and photography, just the bare minimum that I can get my work done with. Because when I was shooting heavy on Canon way back in the day, damn if I didn't have a stupid collection of glass that I almost never used. But headphones, <laughs> headphones, have, I've I've gotten real bad about again. Okay. Getting into some news, uh, let me get this queued up here. Uh, so this first story, like I said, is uh, is just for is the realization of what I have been foretelling for months now. Uh, U.S. Senator introduces bill to ban loot boxes and pay-to-win microtransactions. This has come up by way of Ko Kotaku uh, from Jason Schreller. Apologies, I have totally uh, misspelled, uh, mispronounced your name, Jason, Jason Schreller. So this is from the article. Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican out of Missouri, today announced a bill that would ban loot boxes and pay to win microtransactions in games played by minors. A broad label that the senator says will include both games designed for kids under 18 and games whose developers knowingly allow minor players to engage in microtransactions. Uh, Holly will introduce the bill, the Protecting Children from Abusive Games Act, to the U.S. Senate soon. In press materials announcing the bill, Holly's team brought up the Activision game Candy Crush as an egregious example of pay-to-win microtransactions thanks to its $150 luscious bundle. 
that comes with a whole bunch of goodies. This bill will also likely apply to a host of online games that feature loot boxes and other ways in which players can spend money, real money, for real benefits. So, uh, oh, I'm seeing from Abraham Artemis, Ugg, Kotaku. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan, but they were one of the first and one of the only outlets to really write this up specifically. Um, again, so I'm, I'm kind of giving credit. This is where I, where I caught the story, so I, I try to give credit where credit is due. Um, if you've been listening to this podcast, if you've been following my soapboxing and wagging my fist to the heavens and the inane ramblings of some gadget guy, this is exactly what we've been talking about for months now. If the video game industry will not police itself, we know politicians would love to get in here and start censoring video game content. Every single time there is a new entertainment, uh, a new form of multimedia, if it's music, if it's radio, if it's television, if it's movies, if it's comic books, if the industry does not police itself in terms of content, politicians get involved. We do not want politicians involved in our content, but that means video game developers really need to start taking content seriously, not just the story content. If a story is mature, that's all we get for the video game rating. If there's blood and guts, it's a certain rating. If it's cute, cartoony characters, it's a different rating. They also need to factor in the play mechanics into their rating. I do not actually have a problem with gotcha mechanics. I just don't think that they should be rated E for everyone, T for teen. If you're dealing with mature concepts like random number generating events that pay out with exceedingly low odds slot machine style. And if you build your game on a ton of grind to unlock content that can then be uh, circumvented by spending dollars on gems, then that needs to be an adults only game. I don't care if it's Mickey Mouse, I don't care if it's FIFA, I don't care if it's Star Wars, I don't care if it's Marvel. All of these family-friendly family franchises that Disney gets to sit on, for example, those all need to be adults only if they're going to use these types of mechanics, especially that grind versus random number generator. It's why I stopped playing Marvel Future Fight, is the end game just got crazy for grind for months, acquire these gems, Throw them into a wood chipper, and you'll never get what you want. But, you know, you can you can abbreviate that if you just spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars in their online store. That is, that is one of the most insidious aspects of, of video gaming in general. Uh, and, and the fact that it's now becoming a major part of AAA gaming. So you can kind of understand that when it's a mobile game and you get the game for free and then you just throw throw your money away in these tiny little microtransactions constantly. Like a Candy Crush is, is a good example of that. But now we're spending $60 on a franchise game or, or a AAA game and then it's still built on this, um, uh, this grind mechanic. So they're purposely breaking the game, making it painful to play, and then hopefully hoping that you'll just throw additional cash at them to make the game livable. Again, some of the criticisms that we're seeing from Mortal Kombat, I think, is another example of, well, we don't have loot boxes. We have crypt crates. <laughs> you know, like, screw you. Screw you. I don't, don't build your game on artificial grind mechanics just to make it hurt when we've already purchased your game. So... I, you know, the, you won't hear me say it very often, but Josh Hawley, Republican, thank you for joining this conversation. I really thought this would come from a Democrat first. Democrats have a long track record of, but what someone think of the children when it comes to policing media, right? You know, Tipper Gore out there with, oh, the rap lyrics. Oh, oh, my delicate sensibilities. Um, so I thought the Democrats would have been ahead of the curve on this. They were not. But if it comes from a Republican, I am wholeheartedly going to support this legislation. Video game companies, you you can build all of this all you want, but put that AO label on it if it has a slot machine mechanic. And don't try and hide behind, well, it's, you don't get real money for the payout, so it's not like gambling. That's a lie. We know the dopamine hit. We know the psychology. We know that kids are falling into this and that adults have severe problems uh, dealing with this kind of mechanic also. Go go! look at the whales on a game like Marvel Future Fight. People who instantly unlock all of that content. You're talking about people that are spending thousands of dollars 
a month on a mobile game. Sure, they have the money to, to do it. Awesome. Cool. I would say that that's pretty good evidence that this stuff works, but works in a way that we don't want it to work. So um, that's the gig. Uh, Josh Hawley, um, well done. I, 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 am, I am excited about this piece of legislation joining the conversation. And maybe this could be something bipartisan because old politicians, oh, those video games and the kids, um, might actually create some unity. In our political discourse, both old Democrats and old Republicans can 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 get real cranky about those millennials on their lawns. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> from DOA salesman, if there's more like this, will you be will you be voting Republican? <laughs> Probably not. But again, I will happily support legislation like this because I want the video game industry to lead this charge. And if they are going to uh, to walk away from their responsibilities in terms of content, then something else has to happen. I don't want politicians in charge of determining what content is accessible. Um, uh, again, I think people in Australia would probably agree with some of the shenanigans that you get th you go through for uh, verifying video game content. But um, but again, if there if the game industry is going to lobby against stuff like this, then they need to get tagged. Um, so we're, we've got a lot of comments in here too. Jay Perkins, if anything, adults are potentially more vulnerable to these gambling tactics because they have less time to do all the grinding. And that's actually a pretty good point. One of the reasons why I walked away from Marvel Future Fight was the ramp. I started playing that game nearly from the beginning and the end game felt so fair. You know, they had this jewel mechanic and this gold mechanic, but most everything you could grind in a very reasonable period of time. Um... Over the years, so I started playing that before before Lex was born. Man, I've been playing that game for so long, and I'm not and now. I'm not playing it anymore. You don't even see it in my uh, in my phone reviews. Like I'm not even using it as a benchmark title for graphics performance because I'm so angry at Disney for allowing this to to keep going. Um, but yeah, as as that end game got you know, sort of paywalled and higher paywalled and higher paywalled. And they started doing more subscriptions. Like you could subscribe for a certain number of jewels every month and then subscribe for a certain number of materials every month. And you're like, every month I would be spending 25 bucks a month just to kind of keep up with the paywall ramp. And then last year they just went all out. Like, you know, here's, here's like a new tier three uniform upgrade, all of these new materials you had to acquire. And like, this is going to take me months to rank one character to be competitive against my other um, uh, team members. So I had this little guild that I would play with. Like This is insane for a game that has over 200 characters. So it would either take me months to rank one character out of hundreds, or, well, just for a couple hundred dollars, like $200, I could get really close to end game ranking. <laughs> You're like, are you crazy? 200 bucks for one character to be competitive online. This is nuts. This is absolutely not the kind of video game experience I want to share with my daughter moving forward. This is this is rough. Abraham Artemis. Ha <laughs> ha. End game. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. J Rods. I think it's the Republicans who tried to censor rap lyrics in video games, et cetera, back in the day. So, um, oh, no, and Gary, Gary Fleshner. No. So, again, the history of censorship in multimedia spans both Democrats and Republicans. But most recently for film and for music, the Democrats have actually been more aggressive about censoring content. We got rap lyrics because of Tipper Gore. Um, so uh, that 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 was, uh, again, for being a, a liberal um, that was not a good look for us. But then when it came to video games, you had dudes like Jack Thompson, you know, oh, those kids playing all of those murder simulators. And I feel like he was probably a little bit more um, uh, Republican leaning or right leaning. But again, this is generational. This isn't left or right. This is politicians don't really get it because they don't do it. You know, like, I, I, I hate to say it, but 
I'd love to see what AOC has to say about something like this, just because she's at least closer in age to interacting with and being aware of the content that goes into these things. So I don't know. Um, LGH Delma, from a pure financial economic perspective, why should the industry police themselves? It's not like the government will push them further back than what's reasonable. <laughs> I hope that that was being sarcastic because the industry should learn from movies, music, television, and comic books. Go look up the history of comic books and censorship. You do not want the government involved in what is acceptable content to distribute and what is not. Because that is a broadsword solution to something that needs a very nuanced scalpel. Mm -hmm. Yolanda Rowe. Tip Tipper Gore was the culprit thanks to hearing Prince's darling Nikki. <laughs> and just how rough is that if Tipper if if Prince was what set off Tipper Gore? <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious j rods uh oh no from reno renovadio they should turn congress into a land party for a day and watch the fur fly <laughs> man i mean with esports on the rise and with a whole new generation of gamers that are only interacting with games as service god man that's this is going to be tough this is going to be a hard thing to deal with but this is why the video game industry should have been ahead of the curve instead they went for short-term profits and i think it's gonna burn us i think it's gonna burn all of us that fifa and ea got so heavy into these predatory microtransactions breaking their games so that you would spend more to make the games playable that mechanic is so bad for the industry long term but now we're going to have to deal with the repercussions of that having gotten entrenched. You know, the roots of that are pretty deep now. And uh, digging that all up is going gonna, is gonna to mean we're going to have to break a lot of stuff first. I, I can only take some solace in the fact that single player campaign gaming has never been stronger. You know, I have zero interest in a Red Dead Redemption online. But, you know, I got some play out of Red Dead Redemption 2 just on my own. And that was, that was satisfying. But God of War was awesome assassin's creed was solid re2 the remake is so good i mean again we're kind of in a, a with everything exploding around fortnite and uh apex and all of these sort of uh super crazy battle royale type games um we're also in a golden age of i spent 60 dollars on god of war and i felt like i got multiple movies worth of entertainment like that was a good buy for me so um so uh, at least there's some hope there, you know, like there's, there's a feeling like, oh, this, this could still get better. Uh, oh, and DOA salesman. We need more stores like good old games. That's another one too. I love humble bundle. I, I have a humble bundle. If you go to some you can click on that and you can subscribe to the humble bundle. And, um, that's a way that you can support, uh, support this podcast. But, um, I love Humble Bundle as a store. You get some great game sales there. Good old games. You can find some great classic games. It's awesome. Um, it, it's it's nice having that as competition. Like, I'm not going to be too cranky about Epic if they can uh, continue to improve their game service. Uh, I just like having more options and more opportunity to also archive old games. Games that would often disappear because they weren't crazy bestsellers, the publisher would pull them, the distribution would sort of uh, vanish. Uh, games as history is also a very scary topic that I hope someone will document. Um, we, we should see a documentary about all of the games that have just vanished and disappeared from the early days of video gaming to today. Oh, and John O'Shea with a super chat. Thank you, John O'Shea. Thank you for supporting production on this channel. I'm going to take a sip of water here real quick. <laughs> from Bart is 12. Witcher 3 is like 20 movies then. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> Again, I, I that that's that's sort of my my threshold is I want to know that you know, my dollars are sort of comparable. What I would spend on a movie versus what I would spend on a video game, have I gotten my money's worth? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Ghost in your screen. This is an interesting point before we move on to the next, uh, um, uh, to the, to the next, uh, news story here. 
I assume the U.S. government will be reasonable as well. We aren't talking about violence and nudity, but gambling. And unlike many other countries in the U.S., gambling is allowed and not policed. That is completely not true. We have crazy brutal regulations on the gambling industry. For example, uh, the video game industry can do things like loosely play with payouts. So you've got a random number generator. They can track how many times you engage with that and change up the odds on the fly so that you will be more or less likely to keep throwing money into this grinder. If you're someone who's very quickly turned off, they'll ramp up the payouts so you'll feel better about paying in. If you're someone who's paying in a lot and it doesn't seem to matter, then they'll radically reduce the payouts so that you'll keep feeding money into the machine. If you check out gambling commissions, that's a huge no-no. That's a real big problem. And, and uh, casinos, especially in Las Vegas, casinos go through all kinds of verification, certification, and constant random checks to make sure that they aren't playing with the payout mechanics on slot machines. That's just one example. Um, we, we, we have obviously gotten into some odd territory in the United States when it comes to online gambling and uh, gambling across state lines. I think that's still a Wild West gray area of legality that our current politicians are completely incapable of policing. But that's also why I don't think they'll, they'll be reasonable about video games because video games are just that dumb thing that kids waste their time on. Um, however much money is spent lobbying Congress from video game companies, the stigma and the optics of video gaming still looks real bad to older generations than me. So if anything, this will be the wedge that they use to get in and then start censoring other types of content. Oh, well, you've got gambling mechanics in here. And you know what? We're real concerned about this game that was rated T for teen that that shows women in skimpy bikinis. I don't know that that's going to that, that should fly again. That's. If we want to talk about slippery slope arguments, because I'm usually not a big fan of slippery slope, um, we deal with the problem here and now, and then we deal with the repercussions moving forward. We don't hold back because something might happen. But I think our government has a pretty clear track record of taking that slippery slope when it comes to multimedia and really hitting it hard. Again, you want to look at the, the history of comic book censorship in the United States. That is a pretty good example of what can and probably will happen if Congress gets too involved in policing content and mechanics in video gaming. Ah, all right, let me just cross my legs here. Whew. Uh, let me get this out of the way here. And next story. Um, just a quick one. I know I said the first one was going to be quick, and it's already 945. <laughs> We're almost halfway through the show. I've covered one news story. Uh, this is pretty much par for the course. Uh, cue this up. This is direct from Reuters and exclusive from Reuters. Amazon rolls out machines that pack orders and replace jobs. This is from Jeffrey Dastin. Uh, Amazon.com Incorporated is rolling out machines to automate a job held by thousands of its workers boxing up customer orders. The company started adding technology to a handful of warehouses in recent years, which scan goods coming down a conveyor belt and envelopes them seconds later in boxes custom built for each item. Two people who work on the project told Reuters. Amazon has considered installing two machines at dozens more warehouses, removing at least 24 rolls at each one. These facilities typically employ more than 2,000 people. Each one of these machines capable of replacing up to 24 humans that pack your stuff. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised that it took Amazon this long to make a move like this. You know, they've been generating some negative buzz about employee health, uh, working conditions, pay for working conditions, their holiday, their seasonal employees are, I, I, I think, uh, I, I want to be careful how I phrase this, but... Um, they often get the short end of the stick for worker benefits, worker comp, um, you know, healthcare, things like that. It's not easy. This is a big challenge, but I, I want, you know, I'll, I'll have the link in the show notes, but go and check out the video that Reuters put together because this assembly line robot thing is 
surprisingly sophisticated. Like, I would have an expectation that, oh, well, this robot's going to be good at certain types of, like, boxes. So if you've got little boxes, the robot's going to be great. But then you've got weird envelopes or you've got, you know, um, oddly shaped products. You know, you're always going to need a human for some of these specialty goods. And that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, right now, it just seems to be limited to size. Like, after a certain size, the robots just run out of cardboard. But they've got these U-shaped um, cardboard um, flats. And then the robot will see the product come down. It drops onto the flat, and then the flat is manipulated. The flat piece of cardboard is manipulated to be just the right size container for uh, for the product that they're shipping. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but again, this is also why I think we need to start entertaining longer-term conversations about manufacturing, about blue-collar jobs, about uh, increasing, increasingly, you know, a, a concentration of wealth at the top of the, the the top of the stage. These workers are basically going to start getting replaced as they as they age out. You know, what this means is eventually Amazon's just going to stop hiring packers, and as packers leave. Um, they'll just, you know, sort of ramp up the installation of these packing robots and packing machines, you know, so that, that becomes another one of these industrial manufacturing gigs that just falls by the wayside. And we need to find a solution. We need to find a replacement for that. And we need to find some solutions for that. And we need to start experimenting. We should have been experimenting 10 years ago. Now we need to be experimenting for real. <laughs> DOA salesman waiting for the robotic slippery slope argument. They took our gerbs. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, the robotics thing is scary, but I don't think our country is even ready for the conversation about white-collar jobs that we're going to lose to AI. Um, the blue-collar jobs might actually stick around a little bit longer just because it's harder to build a line and train robots for some of these, you know, really uh, complicated manual dexterity tasks than it might be to program an algorithm to replace someone who just sits in a cubicle all day. <laughs> and that's going to take a hit to our economy, too. <sighs> From uh, Waris Amir Muhammad, I'm all in on a robot tax. <laughs> Ah, from LFA Reviews. This is why I opted in to learn how to repair the robots in our robotics division. You guys seen those parking lot robots? I'll be fixing those. Good play. Because, you know, people are talking like, oh, self-driving trucks are going to take over. And you're like, the mechanics on, you know, automated uh, driving vehicles and these assembly line robots are going to do real well. Actually, still not a bad time to... To look at other trades, too, like being an electrician. Because, <laughs> you know, robots run on electricity, and there aren't enough electricians out there. Um, from Shrill, oh, what did Tim, uh, replying to Tim Baxter, I don't see what the initial comment was. From Daniel Ramos, what about converting these packers from Amazon to Amazon drivers, since Amazon is developing their own service with delivering their own packages? So, again... From what I understand, Amazon's play on delivery drivers is not dissimilar from like Lyft and Uber. Um, I know that they're they're now getting into having more branded vehicles, but when it started, it was just some dude in a truck who was driving his own vehicle to drop off packages. And sometimes he'd wear an Amazon shirt and sometimes he wouldn't. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily going to be a good fit. You know, like a good long-term replacement strategy, maybe a good short-term one, but I don't think you need when when one shipping center has two thousand employees in a very concentrated location, those delivery drivers aren't cross-country. You have two thousand people in one packing warehouse. You don't have two thousand drivers worth of jobs, and in fact, what we'll probably see Amazon move towards is also, excuse me is also some sort of automated delivery service. Um, I, I floated this way early. When I first started doing this podcast, we were joking about Amazon drones. I don't necessarily think drones are going to be the the sky is filled with flying robots. I, I think eventually we'll, we'll kind of rein that in if it ever becomes popular. I don't think, I really don't, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. But when you float the idea of flying drones, people go, oh, wow, that's wacky. 
But then the idea of self-driving delivery trucks is way less wacky. So your Amazon locker literally drives up to your front door and you walk outside and there's a locked box and you punch in a special code or you scan a QR or something that opens up just your locker. You take out your product and the vehicle goes driving off. You don't need to have, you know, a, a delivery driver drop the item off on your front step. In fact, so many consumers will think that's great because like, hey, I, I ordered this package and it was going to get dropped off at my home, but now I got called away and I'm at my son's, you know, soccer game. Can you deliver it to this location? And you send a message and the self-driving truck just drives off to your kid's soccer field and you can pick up the thing there. That's, that's, you don't need humans for that, you know? So I think we're going to see a big hurt over the next 10 years on these types of, uh, on this type of economy, on these types of jobs. Um, lots of conversation about this one um, from Waris Amir Muhammad. But what about self-repairing robots? <laughs> I mean, that'll come too. But again, uh, w once we get to that part, and you know, AI is iterating on itself, then we're all we're all screwed. When uh, you know, software can write its own software, we're done. Um. Abraham, Artemis, robots and computers can generally do more complex things while surprisingly can't do the same with things we deem simple. But that's what's changing. Again, a packing robot at Amazon is kind of a big deal. Uh, from Sharil Abdul Rahman, uh, as good as robots are, some jobs are still required for humans. Delicate and precise work uh, can only be done by hands like LFA. <laughs> I agree. And, uh, you know, LFA's got the touch. <laughs> for it, for it, I'm imagining the Terminator movies, but with Amazon instead of Skynet as the villain. It's rather funny. <laughs> it's funny because it's becoming closer and closer to reality. All right. Um, I've got one cell phone story here before we take a quick break and talk about um, uh, Reddit. But I do want to knock this one out real fast because it makes me kind of sad. Cue this back over here. This is from Digital Trends, but a number of outlets covered this one. This is just the first one that I caught from Aaron Mamit. Uh, I don't think that's how you pronounce his last name, but I took a stab. Apple reportedly won't roll out iOS 13 to the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, or the iPhone SE. Uh, from the article, Apple is expected to unveil iOS 13 at their worldwide developer conference in June, but is rumored to be dropping support for the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, and iPhone SE. Apple's upcoming version of its mobile operating system will not be rolled out to a substantial number of iOS devices that did receive iOS 12, according to a report by French blog iPhone Soft. In addition to the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, and iPhone SE, iOS 13 will not be released for the iPhone 5S, the iPad Mini 2, and the iPad Air. So, um, this is one of those, like, back and forths. Like, I got a lot of criticism when I was reviewing the iPhone XS because I, I like to point to Apple. There, there's this wonderful idea of support. You get all of these great iOS updates for, for longer than you do on Android devices, but you end up with feature fragmentation as opposed to software fragmentation. Some things obviously won't work in iOS 12 on an iPhone 6 as they will on an iPhone 10. I'll be really sad about the SE, though. If iOS 13 goes to the iPhone 6S, but it doesn't go to the iPhone SE... That's going to be a bummer. The hardware is very similar. It's the same chipset and the same camera in the iPhone SE as in the 6S. And the 6 uh, the, the iPhone SE is still my all-time favorite iPhone. Um, the iteration, the improvements, the form factor, no camera bulge. It's the, one of the last true premium one-thumb smartphones. It's just a great piece of hardware. So if they draw that line there, I think that'll be really frustrating. I think that'll be um, a hard place to push consumers into trying to update their devices. But again, I, I, I would ask a question like, why is it that we feel any pressure to be upgrading for general consumer use? My iPhone SE can still perform the same as or outperform my iPhone XS when it comes to some pretty aggressive use, um, even with numerous updates. Apple developers aren't extracting any more power out of 
high-end chipsets than they were years ago. Um, my iPhone SE renders video the same or faster than my iPhone XS. So really, it's you get a couple extra benefits for camera and ISP processing. JPEG images look better. The video's a little bit better, but we haven't really progressed that far. Not for all of these, it's magical, it's revolutionary, these marketing claims, what we see during a keynote, that stuff doesn't really fly. It doesn't really seem to impact on the ground, in the hand usage. So my hopes are that iOS 13 will be doing something to really leverage and make use of more modern chipsets. You know, like if you're buying an iPhone 8 or newer, you should be demanding software that is really taking advantage of that hardware. You shouldn't be excited about legacy support for the iPhone 6, because that doesn't mean you're really getting long-term software support. You're just getting long-term bug fixes. iOS 10 was a mess. iOS 11 to 12 basically just corrected and fixed a bunch of problems that iOS 10 had. So if you bought a phone with iOS 10 at launch, you didn't really get the phone you you purchased that you were promised until it got iOS 12. That to me, I, I have issues with Apple's reputation, you know, in terms of making products that just work and then offering support for those products. If that's the reality of, of owning an iPhone is it took you two years to get the software that you were sort of promised when you bought the phone brand new <laughs> and then battery throttling, yada, yada, yada. So I, I, I hope this means that we'll see like an iPhone SE 2. I doubt we will. I, I think Apple's cheap phone strategy is to try and convince us. I just smashed my fingers into my keyboard. I think Apple's cheap phone strategy is, well, just buy an old phone or buy a premium phone that has fewer features than our luxury priced products, which, again, just feels like the wrong way to differentiate and delineate your products. Um, let's see. Uh, Didier Hernandez, I'd take the SE drop with a grain of salt. I hope so. Um, that's, I would really be disappointed to see the dividing line between the iPhone SE and the iPhone 6S. Uh, and Daniel Ramos, I see occasional rumors of an iPhone SE 2 that might still come out next year, if not later this year. Again, I hope so. I just don't think it very likely. I think Apple will continue on the iPhone 10, uh, the iPhone X and XR strategy, um, which I don't think is is really the right solution for offering a lower cost but new premium smartphone. Again, we, we have so many of these weird dividers. We've got like ultra luxury, f flagship, mid-ranger, entry level, like, the, the market is skewed top heavy in our discussion when most consumers really don't need or want anything at that $800 plus uh, price tier. They're just sort of stuck needing to buy something at that tier because we've left them fewer options and fewer outs. Hey, Fat Produce just joined the live chat just in time for us to take a break. <laughs> I love making this joke. Someone just joins the podcast and you're like, okay, and goodbye. <laughs> Take a sip of water here real quick. Yes, uh, someone was making a joke that that Andrew just woke up. Uh, for it, for it, he actually has a job that prevents him from seeing the first hour of my podcast. We all keep telling him that he needs to quit that job that he loves, that uh, is paying him really well, so that he can watch the first hour of my podcast. It's uh, it's really a shame, you know. I, I feel like this would all be better for us if he would uh, make that jump. Okay, so um, quick break, middle of the show before we wrap up with the uh, smartphone block. Uh, my my plea for support and uh, participation, excuse me, uh, for a while now, I have been trying to find ways to help content creators uh, improve their metrics, uh, find audience, find monetization. But uh, one of the basic tools that we have our, at our disposal, uh, service Reddit, uh, where you can vote up and vote down different news topics and links that you share, is not the most accessible to new content creators, um, especially when for most subreddits uh, in technol in the technology space, especially, they very much frown on things like uh, self-promotion. 
So you're trying to build up an audience. Someone else has to share your video on an Android subreddit. And then if you share your own video on an Android subreddit, it gets removed because the moderators have deemed self-promotion super, super evil. And I get that. When you have a really large subreddit, instead of letting those posts get upvoted or downvoted on their own, uh, policing that content can be kind of tricky. So I created the opposite. Um, if you go to reddit.com slash rglowingrectangles, I'm trying to find ways that we can create a link farm to help signal boost and support smaller producers or producers who you feel deserve more attention. Uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowingrectangles. And so uh, it's it, I mean, you can post links to bigger channels there too, but the main point is we want to find ways to create a more diverse conversation surrounding our gadgets, especially with the way that YouTube prioritizes the popularity contest, where something has to be search popular and then come from a very popular producer for it to get the direct YouTube signal boost. Um, and I feel like that's doing probably the most amount of damage to the current tech discussion we face today, where we don't get different points of view. We get an unending uh, echo chamber of this is popular, so it's the right choice, and this is the only thing that we're going to talk about. And then when competing products show up to that discussion, they're only compared against the popular products so they can lose. And I'm seeing this time and time again in – sometimes very obvious ways, and then sometimes in less obvious and more insidious ways. So uh, Our Glowing Rectangles has a number of people that are posting content right now where the subscriber count is up over last week. We're still seeing growth, seeing more upvotes and a few more comments. So uh, again, with every podcast, I hope people will check it out and participate. Um, you know, Share it if you think someone might be interested in having another platform to share their content, their videos, their reviews, their articles. Um, and then also just to join discussions. So leaving a few more comments will also help all of those metrics because I don't think something like this will ever be a top tier subreddit. But what I hope is with a little bit more popularity, with a little bit more visibility, that content which gets shared here might find a home somewhere else. So it gets posted to our glowing rectangles and then someone goes, oh, well, that's kind of a cool story. Let me go and share that to our technology or our futurism or our Android, our our." our our iPhone. <laughs> Ours are really hard for me to say. It's one of my stutters. And so Reddit is sort of the bane of my existence. But I just want to share, these are some of the top stories on our glowing rectangles this week. Uh, let me click into a screen share here. And so uh, the first one with a shot. Uh, first look, Google Pixel 3a. This is the hottest phone people are talking about right now. So it's unsurprising that one of the top posts is uh, uh, sort of an early introductory look at the Google Pixel 3a. So uh, that's by way of who? Uh, Chris Panton uh, did this video shared by TL Triple XS Racer. Um, top of the week. Obviously, something that I think we'll be talking about a little bit uh, later on in this podcast. Right after that, uh, we've got a sort of a three-way tie. I'm just going to talk about these these next three videos as the as our top three. Uh, this is from JabberTech. The V40 is still a beast in the smartphone market. This is a long-term review look at the V30, uh, the V40 ThinQ. Uh, he, he's, he's been quite taken with it. I know he's produced a couple uh, videos on using the V40. So uh, you can check that out. Another perspective on a phone that many will claim is super underrated when they never rated it in the first place. And then uh, another Pixel 3a, this one from uh, Gadget Match. Um, I, again, I just like their setup and I like their style. Uh, Google Pixel 3a, is it really worth it outside the United States? So uh, this has been, I'm going to click out of screen share for just a second. This has been like the most difficult part of the conversation for the Pixel 3a from my perspective is every time I talk about it, the number of people who have to storm into that conversation to say, oh, but it's too expensive where I live. And you should always pay attention to other markets, not just the United States. And you're like, that's kind of an impossible proposition. So I have to trust that my audience is smart enough to listen to what I say in my experiences using the phone and then apply that to their own regional pricing because I can't go. So here's the Pixel 3a. In the United States, it costs $399. In Australia, it costs $500. 
In uh, New Zealand, it costs $550. In Taiwan, it costs the equivalent of $450. In Saudi Arabia, it costs the equivalent of $600. In Germany, it costs the equivalent of $700. In the UK, it costs the equivalent of $1,100. In Canada, it costs the equivalent of $700. Like, I can't watch that video, and I can't make that video. So <laughs> I'm going to say in the United States it costs $399. These are my experiences for a phone that costs $399. And then you take my experiences and then say, oh, but in my region it costs $500 or the equivalent of $500, and that makes this comparison different. And I think we're all happier for that. Aditya Anil, hashtag some global stock exchange guy. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay, lastly, uh, I, I'm just happy to see this one climb up because, um, one, I just like the dude and I think he makes good content and you should be watching more of his own personal videos. But this is uh, Josh Vergara checking out the Black Shark 2. It's not their fault. Talking about some gaming phone action. Again, I, I think gaming phones are a legit niche and we need to be talking about them in ways that um, uh, that, that help sort of explore why they're different from conventional phones and, and what some of those differences might be as we start looking into OnePlus 7 Pros, faster refresh rate screens, dedicated hardware for, you know, sort of tactile experiences. Um, so those, those are the top stories. We've got two Google Pixel 3As, an LG V40 climbing back up the charts, and the Black Shark 2 all leading the pack on our glowing rectangles. So again, some videos that might have passed you by if you'd only been subscribed to, you know, million subscriber YouTube channels and larger. And that's exactly why I want to flesh out more of this conversation. You got people that are putting in a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of effort and doing things like longer term review cycles. So it's not just I got an LG a week before the embargo and it's a gimmick. And now I'm never going to come back to that phone ever again, and you'll never know how it aged or how it performs. That's not how we should be reviewing these things, is the week before embargo release. That's our full review, <laughs> which is which is poop. It's a dumb thing. So uh, uh, I'm, very, I'm very disappointed in the current slate of uh, smartphone reviews because you'll get dozens and dozens and dozens of different, like, Galaxy reviews and long-term looks and Galaxy one month later and, ooh, living with it for 45 days. Like, okay, cool. Um, what about a Moto? <laughs> what does a Moto G7 feel like after six months? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Abraham Artemis, Josh Vergara's reviews are so chill. They are. I really like his style in general. I know he's doing a lot of cool work with Pocket now. But again, I want to be able to also support his own personal channel uh, because you get a different perspective when someone's sort of on their own than when they need to sort of fulfill a certain editorial obligation. So uh, some, some fun stuff to check out. Definitely some stuff worth talking about there. Okay. Getting into the cell phone block. Um, just wrapping this up with mobile devices and, uh, we do have like a little bit more news because again, this is why I wanted to, why I'm highlighting our glowing rectangles and leading into this next story is because I feel it can be very, when, when you know what to look for, I think it's very transparent when someone is playing an SEO game with the way that they produce tech content. And I'm, I'm, I'm bummed that Viper isn't here for this, uh, for this part of the podcast because Viper and I have shared many a laugh, many a chortle at uh, the, uh, the tech editorial team at Forbes uh, for writing a lot of clickbaity, um, obnoxiously clickbaity articles where they'll take every opportunity to slam a player like Apple but then, you know, they've got a, a just very different concerns and, uh, you know, criticisms. And it's a more nuanced discussion when they go to talk about Samsung. <laughs> it's, again, I, I feel it's it's maybe just a little too transparent when they play that game. So going into screen share here from everyone's favorite clickbait uh, headline article writer, Gordon Kelly at Forbes. 
Samsung confirms radical Galaxy smartphones shock return. <gasps> oh man! Now, just for some perspective, uh, my favorite article articles from Forbes were: uh, if you do a search, search on Google, Forbes quote nasty surprise, and you'll find article after article after article eviscerating Apple products for the tiniest bugs. There's a nasty surprise in I, iMessage. There's a nasty surprise in iOS 11. Uh, Apple users find a nasty surprise in FaceTime. Hilarious. So I, I'm not a huge fan of folding phones, and I think the Galaxy Fold is an alpha product. It should never be put up in the same discussion as a real consumer-facing phone. You want to buy it because it's expensive and it's a prototype of what is to come for folding display technologies, go nuts. I'm not going to blow $2,000 on a Google Glass-like Explorer experiment, which really won't be a daily driver phone when it's the clumsiest tablet I've ever seen. But let's see. Gordon, Gordon gets real persnickety about the tiniest little flaws in iOS. So let's see how the tone of a Samsung article plays out with a product that is super fragile, really isn't ready for consumer-facing primetime, has been recalled from reviewers, and still doesn't have any official release window as at the time that this podcast uh, went to went to broadcast. So let me go back into screen share and let's let's just kind of dig into a little of this here real quick. Um, while Samsung's exciting Galaxy Note 10 looks like the most complete smartphone of 2019, the year's biggest failure has just got a second chance. Okay, hold on. That's his introduction. There is no news on the Galaxy Note 10, but it's exciting. And the most complete smartphone of 2019 with no no real news on what the Note 10 is going to be. That's how he's kicking off a story. The feel goods. You want the feel goods about Samsung, right? Can't handle any criticism of Samsung. You know, the Samsung White Knights will come out and 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 brigade on you. So, let's make sure everyone feels good. Feels good about the Samsungs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, speaking to the Korean, to the, mm, try that again. Speaking to the Korea Herald, Samsung CEO has confirmed the radical Galaxy Fold smartphone will return after orders were surprisingly canceled last week. Ko even stated that we will not be too late when asked if the Galaxy Fold could be back in the hands of buyers before the end of May, the original launch month. This would be a dramatic turnaround following a nightmare few weeks for what was the world's first commercially available screen folding phone. Was it the first? And actually, now I'm asking this in earnest. I'm not trying to be snarky. Did the Royale FlexPi beat the Galaxy Fold? This is where it would help to have like an actual editorial and, and news team digging into sort of the timing on those releases. Did, was, was the Galaxy Fold slated to ship before the Flex Buy? Someone, uh, someone correct me in the comments on that because I, I can't remember. All right. Um, initially lauded by Samsung on stage in February, things quickly turned sour when the first batch of review units began failing in April. After initially dismissing the error, error, Samsung became uncharacteristically defensive, pulling teardowns of the device and demanding the return of all devices. Then last week, customer orders were stopped. Uh, the developments led to mocking and memes, but Ko's, Ko's statement is great news. Ko's statement, which has no shipping dates, has no additional information on improvements to the design or what steps they're taking to improve a terrible uh, design for a folding tablet. This is great news. It's great. And why is it great? Back to the article. Folding phones have the potential to re-energize the flagging smartphone sector, and a shape-shifting form factor is far more interesting than another bezel, notch, or megapixel war. I mean, I kind of feel like the Galaxy Fold is exactly a bezel conversation for the front 
screen is just a huge porthole of a tiny screen and a giant body. Has one of the most obnoxious notches, <laughs> asymmetrical cutting into the tablet view, and is a huge part of the megapixel war for having so many damn cameras on the thing. Um, but I digress. <laughs> Let me get to the wrap up here because the wrap up actually, actually made this is what made me chortle. Because you know, like I think so far he, he's putting in a lot of adverbs about how exciting everything is with Samsung. When you know, like he never does the same thing for Apple. But we get to the end. Yes, the Galaxy Fold is clearly a Generation One product, but it also has greater ambition than even the year's most feature-packed smartphone. And with rivals like Apple actively testing the format. Everyone should want the Galaxy Fold to succeed, so the pressure to respond mounts. At this stage, the odds remain stacked against the Galaxy Fold regaining its credibility, but it's back in the game, and that's what counts. We're getting aspirational. It's so inspired to have a, a phone which solves zero problems for mobile computing and raises our price threshold to an astronomically high tier. And that's why we should want it to succeed. I want folding screen technologies to improve, but I, I, I do not want us to pretend that this is a real phone. It's not. A tablet which folds into a clumsy phone is the worst of both worlds. For those of you who aren't really... Who, for those of you who aren't really using Android tablets, why aren't you using Android tablets? I mean, you can answer that question. So if you're, the killer question is like, <laughs> you don't like how the software interacts or you don't like app support, you don't like any of these issues with having Android on a larger screen, that's not going to be fixed by a very fragile uh, foldable tablet. That, in fact, that to me would be worse. It's a weird squarish form factor with an asymmetrical notch with a plastic screen that will be easy to scratch or damage or bend or crimp or crease. And then that becomes your phone, your main mission critical communications device. This is not a real product. This is not what is going to solve the smartphone industry's lagging sales. What's going to solve this for manufacturers is stepping away from the smartphone, is, is improving our interaction with data and services, uh, getting us seriously into the world of augmented reality and solutions for heads-up displays and better integration with cars and other forms of uh, screen manipulation. Like, I'm not excited for Android Q because it'll know when it's an, on a folding phone. I'm excited for Android Q because it's going to have a desktop mode that plugs into a monitor or TV or any other type of display, and it seems like it's going to do it really well. So that, to me, is a huge perk because now when I want more screen, I can plug my phone into a bigger screen, and my phone is actually as powerful or more powerful than a mid-spec laptop these days. It doesn't help me in a product that I'm going to be scared to take out into the wild. Excuse me. So, um, yeah. I, I, I feel like that's a pretty good example of let's chase the popularity of one company and let's use another company for SEO fodder. And I feel like Forbes has been a pretty good example of that. We can get tons of outrage traffic when we slam Apple, and then we can make Samsung fans feel real good about themselves by comparison with every um, with every article that they put out. So again, I'm not bringing this up because I feel like you should traffic Forbes more. I'm bringing this up because like this is media literacy, right? Like you can see a very clear example of of how this kind of content is used to generate traffic in one direction. Right. There's there's a one way street here for the editorial side of their tech commentary. <laughs> Some guy on the interwebs. Forbes makes me lose all faith in humanity. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to lose all faith in humanity because of Gordon Kelly. But um, I, if we're aware, then we know how to combat that. And we can we can express an insidious bias. Right. We, we can we can help that. We can help educate based on that. 
when someone is not clear about their preferences before you go into a review on something they might not like, then it's easy to act like, oh, well, someone's objective. They're just calling it like it is. They're just giving us the pros and cons. But that's why I, I take such great pains to say like, hey, I'm a hardware guy. I like audio. This is what I look for in a camera. And you will not share all of those experiences with me. But I am a human being with a single perspective. So if you don't know where I'm coming from, you are getting an incomplete view of my experiences with this product. Why I might get excited about one thing over the other. From at Fat Produce, uh, marketing is pushing the folding phone narrative more than anything. Um, marketing and pricing, you know, again, it's a, it's a way to put a two thousand dollar price tag on something that feels futuristic, but solves no problems and doesn't do anything better than spending two thousand dollars on a laptop and a smartphone combo. <laughs> Um, the Sentinel 909, how has Samsung been forgiven this after the debacle of the exploding note? Shouldn't they be under severe scrutiny? Um, I actually have to say, I, I really like how Samsung responded to the Note 7. Remember, they had that giant international press conference. Um, it was like an hour long broadcast digging into these scientific studies. And I mean, like it was a show. It was a dog and pony show. Whether or not there was any real substance to that discovery, but what did they do? They made the grand effort to address consumer concerns, and they didn't just try to sweep the recall under the rug and then come back a year later with a new product. They they tried to have a public display of their concerns for their consumers. And so I don't feel like the fold rises to that level of debacle. I just think it's a black eye. It was never going to be a real product for a real profit segment in Samsung's lineup, but it they need to at least show some concern or some care moving forward because we know that Samsung display tech is going to be used in all kinds of folding phones and folding products. So they just need to be careful there, and we want to hear just some some public push. But that's also why Samsung's PR right now is is laughable. They're not addressing the real concerns of why this product was pulled, why it was fragile, why it's so expensive. They're just kind of going away for a little while and then coming back. Well, that's what LG did with the Fruity Boot Loops. They just tried to sweep Boot Loops on the G4 under the rug and then come back. And then we tagged them for that. So again, if you were tagging LG for a lack of disclosure and a lack of consumer conversation for the G4... This is kind of the same thing for the Galaxy Fold. I want to see Samsung videos coming out talking about improvements to the design, not, oh, we went back and retooled. It'll be back. We can't say anything more about it. <laughs> Just trust us. That's not how you do business. From Jay Perkins, uh, why does a phone need to be more interesting if it's impractical and fragile? <laughs> Because that's all we seem to entertain right now is the novelty, which is going to be what's so fun talking about the Pixel 3a is uh, there's no novelty there. <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, let's see. Zuriel Losi, it's priced as a tablet. Just call it a tablet. Um, I think we should call it a tablet because the main selling point is that it's a tablet. Tablets are cheap these days. You can get a real cheap Android tablet for way less than an Android phone. Um, you know, I, like I spent some time with one of the Huawei's and it's a mid-spec tablet, but I think it's like $299. Like, these things are not expensive. James Vincent, I love my Android tablet. Arg. Sorry, man. I just, I, you know, I got to call it how I seize it because I, I feel like, from a demographics standpoint, uh, the public in general are not real in love with tablets right now. Mm -hmm -hmm. Let's see. <laughs> Paul Enriquez Gehring, I like watching SGQA while I drink uh, vanilla Pepsi. Beautiful. I I haven't had a vanilla. What I really want is a is a, a cherry Coke Zero. Oh man. I'm trying to cut out cut out sodas, but that's one of my uh, it's one of my weaknesses. Um, let's see uh, from Renovadio, uh, Motorola's folding uh, V. Motorola's folding V looks like a fantastic implementation. So the return to the uh, the razor, 
That's something that I want to see folding screen tech get better at because I think that would be more exciting is a mini phone for just when you need the basics, phone calls, notifications, alerts, and then you can open it up to a normal sized smartphone when you need just a little extra screen real estate. That to me would be a huge perk. I would very much enjoy that as a, uh, as a mobile solution. I am not impressed with folding tablets. And the executioner, foldable's biggest problem is the plastic screen. No way I am transitioning from Gorilla Glass to plastic. I have a big problem with that too. Um, in fact, if anything, I, there was a, a company that was trying to make artificial diamond, uh, diamond displays. I would love to see a return to sapphire crystal displays. I want more durable products, not less durable products, especially for something like a phone, which I do not treat phones well. <laughs> I have to use them very aggressively, especially when testing them. Oh, and something like that could be kind of interesting too. If a, uh, this is some guy in the interwebs, if a foldable phone can be used like uh, can be used like a Surface Go, then we have an interesting niche product. That could actually be something kind of interesting to look at too. Would be laptops, like putting in foldable elements in laptops. Uh, I remember my. Uh, my favorite Android tablet was that Lenovo that had the fake keyboard on it, which was also like a touch sensitive pen area that you could like scribble out notes and would tran uh, transcribe that for you. Um, that could be another interesting solution there. Um, again, I, I just feel like this tech is so new and so fresh. We still haven't found what it is that we want to do with it. Bending, folding displays could bring all kinds of different benefits to different product segments, but <laughs> Again, the the tablet as phone concept just isn't doing it for me. Renovatio isn't the sa that Sapphire screen company Apple pumped eight hundred million into now bankrupt and under investigation for fraud. That company is. That was really sad. Um, but there were other markets that were working on Sapphire, and Sapphire Crystal is well understood and well used for things like watches. Um, Apple still used Sapphire Crystal for their camera covers for a long time. I don't think they are anymore, but they were, I want to say, around the iPhone 4S, so that if uh, the back of your phone got scratched, the Sapphire would guard your camera display. Uh, like I said, watches use a lot of Sapphire Crystal. And then there were a handful of phones. I mean, there was a Virtu that had a Sapphire Crystal display. That was a joke. But then you could look at the Kyocera Brigadier, if you search for the Kyocera Brigadier on my YouTube channel, you'll find a video where I am raking concrete over that screen. And you can see the plastic edges of that phone getting gouged away, but the screen is pristine. There is not a mark on it. And that's not something you can do with glass. Like It doesn't matter how hard you make glass, how well you treat glass. Eventually, the hardness of something like concrete will, um, will mark it up. So we would just need to find some happy balance, you know, a sapphire crystal uh, structure that maybe isn't quite so brittle in a drop, or maybe there's an outer covering of sapphire crystal that can crack more easily, but then there's like a shatter shield, plastic screen underneath. I mean, there, there are different solutions that we could be looking at. It's just a bummer that right now we're going to focus our efforts on things that don't really improve phones and make them more expensive and more fragile, because that's where the market's going to lead us. So that's a bummer. Farid, Farid, why, why no more Kyocera phone reviews? Because I haven't gotten one in a while. Um, Kyocera PR, way back in the day, when I was just a solo reviewer before I joined Pocket Now, was really hard to communicate with and to tap into. Um, I think the only phone I ever got to review was the Brigadier. Uh, the other Kyocera phones that I got to review, I got through AT&T, because I used to have a pretty good relationship with AT&T PR here in Southern California. But that all kind of evaporated, and no one really does that kind of outreach or uh, relationship building anymore. Uh... Mm, they use a sapphire blend. Oh, this is from Sean Williams. They use a sapphire blend. Jerry Rig Everything has tested that numerous times. It scratches at a level less than sapphire, but when he uses a sensor to test the structure, there is sapphire present. Okay. But again, if we were focused on improving that from the iPhone 4 to today, 
we should have better tech, but instead we all kind of just went Gorilla Glass and went, eh. So I don't know. Uh, real quick, I just want to jump into this because again, it's sort of a, an example of how do we game SEO and metrics in our headlines. So we're going to write an article about a OnePlus 7 Pro. You know, OnePlus does really well for SEO on its own, but how could we improve the SEO on a OnePlus story? You know what? Let's find a way to put Samsung into the title on a OnePlus 7 story, right? Because then we get the SEO double whammy. So this is uh, by way of T3.com. OnePlus 7 Pro prices leak, and it's more expensive than the Samsung Galaxy S10e. Can you see what I'm dealing with here? Can you feel my frustration about this game we're playing? Because in what universe, in what galaxy, in what solar system would someone who was seriously shopping the smaller form factor, less tech futuristic Galaxy S10e might also have been really swayed by a OnePlus 7 Pro. What, what, who, who is that consumer that we're worried about there? Uh, un unlocked pricing for an S10e around $750, smaller form factor, and all of the techie, cool stuff in a Galaxy. But you know what? I was also thinking about a ginormous phone with a periscoping camera and a completely different camera array without things like rated water resistance. Man, I just can't make up my mind. I guess the only thing that could possibly weigh in on that decision-making process is, is the price. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. The, uh, the S10e is cheaper. I guess that's what made up my mind for me. I would posit, while I'm sure... I am positive that that person exists who is really making a difficult choice between the OnePlus 7 Pro and the Galaxy S10e and is going to be swayed by a price difference of like 10 bucks. I don't think that there are many people that fall into that category. In the chat, correct me if I'm wrong. Please join this conversation if you were seriously shopping an S10e versus a OnePlus 7 Pro and that the few bucks more you might spend on a OnePlus 7 Pro are going to push you to an S10e. I won't make fun of you. I will commiserate with you. Smartphones are getting expensive. We have some concerns there. I just don't really think you exist. <laughs> Paul Enriquez Gehring, really? A phone with Pro in its name is going to be cheaper than a $750 phone? Huh? <laughs> From Fat Produce, OMG, a $10 price difference clutches my pearls. <laughs> but I do want to get into this. So, oh, whoops, that's not the, there we go. Uh, One plus seven Pro pricing. So we've got some word that according to leak to leaksters, I hate that that word exists. This is by Aaron Brown, by the way, um, at 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 T three. So again, from from the top of the article, ouch! This is exactly what we were afraid of. Were we? Sorry, were we afraid of the most expensive One Plus being more expensive than the least expensive Galaxy? Was that really the fear we were all having? Because they do the thing in here that I love where they just go like, oh, a couple years ago, OnePlus phones used to sell for like $300. Now they're more expensive. Blah. <sighs> this is what I absolutely hate about this sort of informed tech enthusiast commentary. If your big argument is, I want a phone that is totally competitive against a Galaxy and does all the things that I love about the Galaxy, but the only thing that could ever sway a consumer is that you charge way less, you are cancer to the discussion of tech products and tech solutions. 
there needs to be competition and appropriately priced competition at a variety of tiers with different solutions for different consumers, else the smartphone truly is a dead product category. This whole worth it, not worth it, winner, loser, everything is compared against an iPhone or a Galaxy as the predetermined winner is only, is only verified, is only accessible today because of Google search, because of a, an algorithm and a metric which enhances the popularity of things that are popular and works against anything which sort of contradicts that popularity. So we get, this, this is just an article about leakers putting out the price of the OnePlus 7 and it's immediately, immediately negatively compared against Samsung from the very first sentence of this article. Again, I think this is pretty transparent. So uh, according to the leakster, OnePlus 7 Pro starts from 699 euro. 699 euro for the the six for a model with six gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. For everything else that we've been leading towards in um in the OnePlus 7 Pro rumors, I feel like this is perfectly competitive. We're talking about OnePlus's first phone with a quad HD plus wide display, a 90 hertz refresh rate. It's already been ranked by DisplayMate as having one of the highest quality screens on the market. It doesn't have a stupid notch or a hole punch disrupting the display. We know OnePlus phones are screamers. They tend to retain their value higher, better than Galaxies do. Like, I, I don't see where 699 euro for the starter, is a bridge too far. That, to me, is right in line with what we should expect from a company like OnePlus going upscale. Again, the argument here isn't, we're going to make a flagship killer. The argument is, we're going to make a premium flagship. You're going to make a premium flagship, 700 euro sounds like exactly the right price to put a premium flagship. In fact, going above 700 euro, you need to have very good reasons for why a phone should be more expensive than that, right? All of these phones that are $1,000 plus are not worth $1,000. Their resale rates plummet. They're always on crazy specials. There are BOGO. There are trade-in offers. They are subsidizing that so that the people who get those phones on a contract, on a lease, have to pay the full retail price. So carriers are real happy about phones with $1,000 price tags, but that's all fake. That's all artificial. Because if you're the savvy shopper, you can get a great deal. The great deal just takes you to the price that we had two years ago, that we would have had today if we weren't playing these games with pricing. 700 euro, right up front. No games, no shenanigans, no trade-ins, no BOGOs, full MSRP. That sounds right to me. That's where this phone should be. I don't know. Change my view. But this this game that we're playing where Samsung is somehow still the winner with an S10e over a OnePlus 7 Pro, which hasn't even been officially announced yet, seems super suspect to me. I'm just saying. <laughs> Yolanda Rowe. No agenda there. Sigh. <laughs> I'm glorious LDR92. If you are that afraid of higher pricing, get a OnePlus 6T. Perfectly fine phone that will go way down in price once this comes out. The newest only mentality is what has gotten us here. Actually, um, I don't think the OnePlus 6T is going to crash on pricing. A OnePlus 6 can out is is often in the same ballpark as an S9 Plus in terms of resale value. So I would expect with the launch of the OnePlus 7 that OnePlus 6T pricing will probably fall to 350, 400 in that ballpark roughly in there. So uh um that that's kind of the uh that's that's the game. Again, if you buy new full MSR, MSRP and then you want to flip your phone a year later, OnePlus tends to hold on to their value better than Samsung does. Um Renovadio, you're just racist against notches on flagged and reported. <laughs> Oh, yeah. See, so D-Racer 35. This, to me, would be a good, compelling argument weighing the feature sets between two phones. I wish OnePlus would give us the headphone jack back. When they did their survey and 90% of their customers asked to keep it, it still got the Apple treatment. That does make me sad. I just d recently did a look back on the OnePlus 6. The OnePlus 6 is such a screamer of a phone. I mean, the performance on that thing is 
is surprisingly good for a phone now hitting its one-year cycle, getting an update from uh, Oreo to Pi, which Pi was kind of a performance hog, and it still has the headphone jack. It's really good. Um, from LGH Dotma, we need to see how it performs. The 6T had a weak camera, weak speaker, no IP certification, and cost as much as the other high-end phones. Will the OnePlus 7 be better? Well, it didn't cost as much as the other high-end phones. Again, I have to take Samsung at their word. The Samsung MSRP is... $800 plus. A OnePlus MSRP is 550 So we can play games with when phones go on sale or they get price cuts from carriers or distributors, but Samsung says their phone is worth $800 plus. OnePlus says their phone is worth 550 That's That's the gig, the 6T to a Galaxy. That is still where they're offering that as a consumer benefit or a perk. Um, but when it comes to things like Screaming fast performance, phenomenally better software updates, um, and and uh, greater attention to the software community to those details. Uh, I think OnePlus does make a good argument against a more expensive premium phone. I know OnePlus got a lot of hate for its camera, but it was a solid shooter for a mid ranger. Like I didn't really have any any tremendously serious um, like deal breaker uh, criticisms. If you go back and catch my OnePlus Six camera review. It's the same on the OnePlus 6T. Um, the night mode is is good. It's handy. It's not as good as a Pixel, but it's, you know, you have one. My Galaxy S10e does not have a dedicated night mode, even on its most recent software update. So if you care about low-light photography, the OnePlus 6T can actually be easier to use than a Galaxy in a number of situations. Um, and I know we're cranky about things like IP ratings and certifications and stuff, but again, I feel they're making a different cost argument at 550 than they are against a more expensive phone, especially against like a $1,000 iPhone, because I have a hard time justifying a $450 price difference between a, a OnePlus 6T and an iPhone, uh, an iPhone 10s. Um, Sentinel 909, I'm a OnePlus 5T owner, gave up on a OnePlus when they dropped the jack. And the OnePlus 5 had a great headphone jack. It was really good. The OnePlus 6 is more convenient. It's it's more out of convenience. It's not super great. Um, Axon 7 in 2019, it's got the latest update. I'm glad to hear that, Stephen Corbo. The Axon 7 was a beast. Um, do, 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 do. Jay Perkins, as someone who hated the Pixel 3 XL notch before I got my hands on the phone, I think product shots do a horrible job of showing scale. The notch is big, but it doesn't occupy much field of view. I think that's fair. Um, Fat Produce, the only thing that gives me pause on the OnePlus 6 uh, versus the 6T is the battery capacity. That's actually a bit of a concern too, but I feel like the 6 has aged well against phones that are usually comparable. So like Battery life on a OnePlus 6 is better than battery life on an LG G7, and we're in roughly the same ballpark there. Um, and Renov Audio, considering how LGs drop in price really quickly, you might be able to pick up a V50 for 700 soon. Here in Europe, the V40 is at 400 euro with the headphone jack and DAC. I'd still grab it over the OnePlus 7. Um, yeah. So again, we can play games with aftermarket pricing. I think the thing that we all need to be just a little careful of as enthusiasts is only shopping phones based on when they fail in the market. We all know that the pricing is inflated. Companies are trying to build in profit. They're trying to capitalize on timing, the emotional purchase, the emotional side of a gadget purchase. But those are the things that actually kind of encourage the improvements and the new features and the experiments that we want to take advantage of. It's why I kind of hold to a ranking and tiering by MSRP is because that's what the company is claiming the phone is worth. They put the product out there at that price. And that's why I still continue to hold to that as a chart. You know, if I'm putting them in little categories and boxes, because sales happen all over the place. So it's impossible to keep track of every region, every market, and every sale that a smartphone goes by. But the manufacturer is making a claim. The thing that sucks for like an LG or a Motorola is once those prices fall, you condition the customers to only shopping after your product has failed in the competitive argument. 
And that's where we get this. I would totally buy one if it were exactly the same as a popular phone, but you, you, you priced it too high. You priced it, it's too expensive. Well, then you're never going to get competition. No one's going to enter that competitive market if the tech literate are making arguments like that. No one's going to push the boundaries or risk um, the negative feedback from tech enthusiasts if that's the game we're going to play. So we're stuck, you know? I, I mean, I love it when someone can get a great deal on a V-series LG, but we all have to acknowledge, like, the days are numbered for those features that we like on LG phones if we're only shopping them at bargain basement prices that contribute nothing to the bottom line and the health of LG as a company. Then those go away. Then those die. <laughs> so we have to be fine with those things that we like dying so that we can get a good deal right now. And I get it. Money's tight. This stuff is, is really difficult to shop. It's very aggressive. That's also why I'm recommending people hold on to their phones longer to really get their money's worth when they buy a new phone. But this stuff is going to disappear. You know, the writing's on the wall. The smartphone market has plateaued and is on the decline for this being the exciting growth sector of new products, new features, new services. So that's the game. We'll ride it for as long as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, see, and this is exactly the same thing. Hadi Tamimi, uh, I bought a new, brand new HTC U11 for $125 a few weeks ago with a two-year warranty. And too bad that happened only because the phone was on clearance. So um, one of the things that I think is also going to help uh, cook this market even just a little bit more is a return to uh, more reasonable pricing on consumer-focused phones. Why I am so crazy excited uh, having spent a week with the Google Pixel 3a that this phone has been doing everything I've asked of it, has been doing it really, really well. And I haven't found any serious deal breakers at the $399 price. So first of all, um, this I have to do full disclosure. Uh, hashtag Team Pixel sent me hashtag a gift from Google. Uh, so they sent this over in a little care package with this awesome fabric case and a pop socket. Uh, but even before I knew I was getting the phone, you can go back to some of my earlier podcasts where I've been very critical of articles that were declaring the Pixel 3a dead on arrival. Um, you can, I think that was two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago on the podcast. Because what we desperately need here in the United States is more competition at the mid-ranger price, especially that tier that transitions us from entry-level cheap phones to uh, something more expensive in the middle, around four to five hundred dollars, especially as OnePlus is climbing to the five to six hundred dollar territory. This now fills a gap that there really isn't anything else quite like it at four hundred dollars. And why I'm also excited, I, I really did want the smaller of the two. I didn't want the XL, so I'm stoked that Google sent over the Pixel 3a because it's been it's been great. Um, the uh, the main thing that I've I've pushed into, obviously, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, we have the full audio review out. Uh, everything about this phone needs the uh, needs the additional comment for the price. I'm doing big bunny ear air quotes. This is a great screen for the price. This is a great camera for the price. These are great speakers for the price. So happy to have a headphone jack for the price. Um, and I don't want that to be a slight because I feel like this phone absolutely nails a targeted focus on that price point. And it shows us, it kind of shames every other phone in the three to $500 tier that we've had before. Google is extracting performance out of this mid-ranger Snapdragon like I have never seen. I've been big fans of the Snapdragon 620 and 630 series. I love the 660, um, which has been in phones like uh, my beloved, you know, Blackberries. You know, this is a Snapdragon 660. The 670, being just a little bit of an improvement over the 660, this phone feels like 
every other premium flagship phone I've used over the last couple of years. UI performance is fantastic, super smooth, occasional hitches and bobbles here and there, but stuff that I would uh, ascribe to every phone because of Android, not because this is underpowered hardware. And I don't find where any of the concerns that people are having about performance hold water. Again, there's sort of like a tech elitism and a tech gatekeeping from enthusiasts. Well, it doesn't have an 800 series chipset and you can get cheap phones that have 800 series chipsets. When you bench this phone and when you compare performance on this phone, it hangs with Snapdragon 835s. So in a number of more CPU intensive tasks, this phone outperforms the Pixel 2. Where it loses is in more graphics intense tasks. So gameplay on the Pixel 3, not super great. Uh, especially if you're trying to play more console quality games. Like you can forget about Fortnite. I've been trying to play Dandara on it. Not great. Super not good for a game that has very uh, like 16-bit platformer Twitch style mechanics. Like you need to be on point. This game will, uh, this the Pixel 3a will let you down. On Dandara, but if you're playing like gem swapping games or bubble popping games, like you know, forget about it. It's we've had way more computing power than we've needed for the last five years, if that's all you're gonna do. But when you compare it against CPU usage, what are you doing on your phone that you need more than a Snapdragon 835? And I'm asking in earnest. For those of you in the live chat or folks, you want to shoot me a message if you're listening to the audio broadcast later on Twitter or send me an email, what are you doing? Because you don't need a Snapdragon 835 for casual UI navigation, for social media, for you know replying to texts and emails. That's way more processor than you really need if that's what you have to cover on your phone. So not only does the 670 outperform the 835 for CPU tasks, it's also more power efficient. So you get better battery life than a Pixel 2 <laughs> with better CPU performance than a Pixel 2. And this is also why I was taking it back to that camera, camera discussion. I would recommend for those of you using the, the Pixel cameras, have the option to disable HDR processing because the it's one of the most responsive auto shooters if you aren't waiting for the more advanced HDR processing. So that's one of the things where I think Google does lean on the GPU for when they're doing Night Sight or when they're doing the HDR Super Plus uh, style processing, because that does take a little bit longer than it do, than it did on a Pixel Three. Um, but the responsiveness is head and shoulders above my Galaxy S10. So I pull up my Galaxy S10, I turn off HDR and Bixby and all that other mess, and I just try and do a burst of photos on the S10. The S10 is less responsive than the Pixel 3a under the same usage, where on the Pixel 3a, I hit the shutter and it's pop, 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 pop. So much cleaner. So much faster. That is what's exciting about this type of product. And again, we have all kinds of different options if you're in Europe, if you're in Asia, but we don't have those here in the United States, and especially not in a way where someone can easily just walk into a carrier store and see one on display or get good support because a lot of people, their first line of support is going to a carrier store. Someone at Verizon is going to know what a Pixel is. They're not going to know what a Xiaomi is. You know, They're not going to know Oppo nearly as well as they're going to know Google. So that stuff matters, especially for when we're making these types of recommendations for our family and friends. So um, if, if, if there are any specific questions, I'll be producing a video this week, kind of digging a little bit more into my experiences with this phone. But I keep using this, this phrase, you know, this is not a phone for me. But increasingly, there are fewer and fewer areas where this phone makes my work more difficult. I wish it had better sort of OTG support for, you know, advanced networking and screen sharing and stuff like that. That would be nice. I wish it had an expandable storage. I think Google, I, I wish all Google had always included expandable storage on Nexus and Pixel devices. 
Um, the headphone jack is more for convenience, but again, I have a full audio review if you really want to see um, how far that goes. The speakers are great, um, are very, very good for a phone and are best in class for a phone in this price tier and are just a small step behind phones that are more expensive. I just, I, I don't know what it is that we're pretending is off about this phone. I could hand this phone to any number of my family or friends, and they would never know that this was the cheap phone. It doesn't perform like that. It's a monster, and it really shows it off with things like camera performance, like where you'd be most apt to maybe see that. Like, it's great. Just really nice. So um, let me go through some of these comments because I got a lot of questions here coming in. Uh, let me get this down here. From Jonky, is the type of flash storage of the Pixel 3a a real-world issue? I haven't found any significant. Like I said, it's outperforming a Pixel 2 in most CPU-intensive benchmarks that have to pull that data. It's always nice when we have faster storage, but again, why do you want the faster storage? I like to point to faster storage. I love to point to UFS when I'm doing things like video rendering, because that's a perk, but I haven't found... Um, where in real world usage for social media, because that's going to draw more off of your uh, your data connection than anything else. Um, from some guy in the interrobes, we definitely need more Android One devices too. Again, this is a phone that I, I hope Samsung and Apple are paying attention, but it's going to take a hard hit. Um, phones like uh, the Moto G series, uh, Sony Xperia Tens, which you can buy unlocked here in the United States. If if there are a number of people buying Sony Xperia 10s, and then also Nokia, so like a Nokia 7.1 versus a Pixel 3a is a really fun fight in terms of build quality versus performance because that's a good showdown, and we need more of that. But I can't go to a carrier store and buy a a 7.1 where the Pixel 3a will be a lot more accessible. Um, LFA, the Pixel 3a XL shows that cutting the right corners can lead to awesome budget devices. Check, uh, cut out the bells and whistles, so to speak. Completely agree. Um, from Wara Samir, this is a bummer. I'm more, I'm most disappointed with the Pixel 3a's limited storage options. 64 gig is already a little bit lean, um, because I am shooting heavy <laughs> for that camera review and I'm probably going to have to offload. Like I'm going to run out of, uh, run out of space. <laughs> From Paco Street, no info on display out on the Pixel 3a. I've tried it. It doesn't seem to work. My HDMI output will turn on a light, uh, but it doesn't seem to actually send a video out signal. So I, I don't know what else to check on that just yet. I'm going to play around with it a bit more, but I don't think the 3a has um, HDMI out like my BlackBerry does. Uh, uh, um. Let's see. There was another one here <laughs> from Fat Produce. Noted. Pixel 3a gaming limited to solitaire. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you could probably pull off something I, like uh, if you remember some of those old like iPhone 3G era side scrolling zombie killing games. You could probably pull those off, too. <laughs> From Gary Fleshner, Tom's Guide reporting that pixels are being throttled by digital well-being in the background. So apparently this is also a problem with the full-sized pixels. The Pixel 3 and 3 XL seem to perform better when you turn off digital well-being. So I, I'm, I'm not surprised if that's also a problem with the, uh, the less expensive pixels too. Um, let's see... <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what you mean. So this is from Piscean 45 Tech. High-end Samsung ceramic black only use spending 600 pounds on high-end mid. Would rather go high-end for the extra features and latest everything, better costs overall. Um, but this is, this is why we need to have a conversation about the mid-range because that's not the reality here in the United States. Again, I'm, you know, you're going to look at what the pixel costs in your region or your market. This is a phone that is clearly designed to disrupt the United States mid-range. And 
people are saying, oh, I could buy a Galaxy S8 and that would be better. And they're like, how? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how a Galaxy S8 truly is better. It's different. There are some things that are a little bit nicer about the hardware. The performance is actually going to be kind of a lateral move if you're not really into high-end gaming. And then you're at the end of the Galaxy S8's software life. Whereas you're at the beginning of the Pixel 3a's multiple years of support. So again, that's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison. An old, a, a two-year-old flagship phone is not the same conversation as a brand new mid-ranger if the person you're talking to cares about things like software support and security patches and updates and bug fixes. What do we think is really going to happen if I recommend a Galaxy S8 versus a Pixel 3a? Uh, Sean Williams, the battery life on the 3A XL is insane. I cannot believe how long the phone lasts on a charge. So uh, on my Pixel 3, because I don't have the XL, I have the 3A, uh, it has easily gone all day into the night. So for Mother's Day, I pulled the phone off the charger at 6.45, and then I plugged it back in at around 12.30, just after midnight, and I still had 40% of the battery left for a pretty active day of shooting photos, shooting videos, and uh, taking Mother's Day calls and phone calls, and it 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 was used. And I still had, um, a, a, it was I, I think it was actually closer to like 38%, but that's a pretty good chunk. I mean, like I could go all night and still make it through part of the next day um, with without having to like, play games with the battery life. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, from Paul Enriquez, Garing, the ISP in the 670 is great for the camera, which is probably why they put that SOC in the Pixel 3a. I, I would agree. Uh, again, I think they are leaning on some of the hardware advantages moving from the 670, uh, 660 to the 670. Um, from Didier Hernandez, the XZ2 Compact is still a beast and is about $400. And actually, Sony, I would say, that's a good argument because Sony's really good about software updates. I mean, my XZ1 got a Pi update. That's that's awesome. Um, from Paul Enriquez, Google did almost what Apple did with the iPhone SE and priced it lower in 2019, <laughs> which is it's just pretty cool. Um Let's see. A lot, lots of uh, of thing of of replies here. From Kyle Sousa, the thing that keeps me on high end Samsungs and LGs is the everything in the kitchen sink mentality. I've witnessed in wireless charging. I've invested. Oh, I've invested in wireless chargers. I've invested in SD cards. I've invested in decent audio, and. Increasingly, I'm going to say, because I agree with you, I mean, like, I'm not going to give up on my LG G8 just because the Pixel 3a is way better than I expected it to be. But I also need to acknowledge that I am not the norm. <laughs> and so I, I keep wanting to say, what is it that you are doing with your phone that requires that higher end performance tier? And if you don't have a good answer for that, $400 is going to get you an incredible experience that's going to it's going to do better than just cover the basics like so many people have alluded to. Like this is great performance for getting your daily work done. <laughs> From Randy Garcia, most people I know don't really care about software support unless there's a massive change, otherwise they only care when there's a notification. Randy Garcia just because people don't care about it doesn't mean we shouldn't be pushing it. Again, you as the tech enthusiast should care about the security and the, uh, the safety of your family and friends' data. We care about this. They shouldn't have to care. General consumers should not have to care about software support. It should just happen so that they are always on the most protected, the best, the most up-to-date, fixed bugs, et cetera, et cetera. They should not have to care about that, but it should happen for them. Otherwise, we have malware issues. Remember, it, wasn't, it was only a couple of years ago where like 
a huge swath of the population was on like Android Froyo era phones with tons of security risks and threats and exploits. The people who are most vulnerable in our society on hardware that was the easiest to exploit. Again, we should care about that so that when we make a, 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 a recommendation for how someone should spend their money, that they at least are informed as to what the potential benefits and risks might be. In daily operation, of course they should not care about that because it should just happen for them. When I talk to my mom, she's not really going to be digging into every app update and constantly polling Google for software updates, but when one pops up, she's going to run it. And we should just auto set these on our family and friends phones so that like in the middle of the night, they just run the update for them so that they're always on the security edge and they always have that kind of support. Saying that that's going to be a purchasing decision for someone who doesn't have us as a resource, of course not. They're not going to list that and they're going to say, oh, I want a phone that has a pretty screen and a great camera. Cool. But where are they turning to for help with making a purchasing recommendation? Because they're not turning to us anymore. They're just listening to advertising. So, you know, you have Apple versus Samsung is the majority of North American smartphone. It's like 85% of the market is Apple or Samsung here in the United States. We could do better than that. Uh. <laughs> from Coilhead Fred. Most people I know don't update update their devices, their iPhone owners, because they are afraid it'll ruin the experience they are used to and possibly mess it up. And again, there should have been a much bigger legal repercussion for Apple throttling devices with software updates. Coilhead Fred, at least try and inform people from the iPhone 6S on. That performance did get better because Apple started bug fixing, but you also have to go and talk about battery replacements too. Um, it's just a bummer that more of my family and friends didn't jump on that last year when their mea culpa was, oh, well, we'll charge you less to replace the battery since we throttled your phone. Mm -hmm. But remember, they actually brought that up during their shareholder investor calls that the battery replacement program was so popular, they could actually chart that as one of the reasons why iPhones were selling less. Hmm. Gee. No regulatory agency needed to look into that business practice, I guess. Uh, so, um, just to wrap us up, because uh, I think we're, we're at that time. We're over two hours now. Um, I'm very positive on the 3A. Some more videos to come soon. Camera review. I'm very, I'm very happy with the performance on the camera. That's no big surprise there. Uh, but it, the, the other thing that I just wanted to bring up, I, I sort of made this... Uh, I, I started this conversation on Patreon where I'm trying to shake up some of my reviewing, some of my schedule. Obviously, this week is going to have a ton of OnePlus news. The official reveal for the OnePlus 7 is this week, and I'm hoping I'll be able to jump on that train. Um, I, I really do want to spend some time with the OnePlus 7 Pro and see what their their version of a flagship phone resembles. But at the same time, I'm trying to put more of my money where my mouth is. I have a limited amount of video production capability. Um, I'm a team of one person making everything. Uh, but I, I do want to extend a little bit more attention. The Pixel 3a helped reinforce why we need to have more conversations in the mid-range. But that also means we need to have more conversations at the entry level. If the phone is a commodity... And it's not the exciting lifestyle defining product that it was from a couple years ago, then there is a market for people who just need to know about, especially here in the United States and in North America, like, could you get by on a $150 phone? Could you get by on a $100 phone? So I spent some time with a cool pad, which is a $40 phone, and it wasn't a, an experience that I would prefer. It was a tough experience, but, um, they recently just put out another phone and they are cribbing so many good ideas from Nokia that this phone is actually, I think it might be a little exciting. So um, it's, it's going to be on Metro, Metro by T-Mobile. And this is the CoolPad Legacy. Retails $130. 
It's a full HD, uh, two by one aspect ratio display, Snapdragon 450, 32 gigs of storage, three gigabytes of RAM, and a dual lens camera in a form factor, which is pretty big. It's a, what is this, a six, 6.36 inch display. So, you know, that's, that's real big in my little hobbit hands. Uh, and it's not terrible. Where the, 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 the old cool pad, I forget what that one was. The $40 cool pad was a very rough experience for an, and even for an Android Go device. So I'm going to spend a little time with this phone too. Metal trim on the sides, a plastic back. It feels a lot like a Lumia 925. If you remember the uh, polycarb Lumias with the metal trim. Um, this phone doesn't suck. It's not bad. And to think that it's $130 out the door is pretty exciting. So um, increasingly, I want to spend more time finding some stuff like this because I can point to my family doing fairly well and we're spending $400 on a phone isn't a hardship, but they don't want to spend $1,000 on a phone. That's a great market of people to talk to. But below that, I feel like there are a number of people who might be getting kind of gouged on products that they probably don't need um, if we're not talking fairly about other solutions in the market. You know, again, those of us watching this, $130 CoolPad Legacy is not a phone for us. Probably not a phone for us. But we know people who will do well with that phone. We just need to know about them too so that we can talk about this stuff also. So, um, <laughs> <sighs> let's wrap this show up. Um, Coilhead Fred with a super chat. Thank you for the work you do. I'll see you on Patreon. That's uh, just a little plug right there. Thank you so much for supporting production both here and on Patreon. A lot of these conversations will end up on patreon.com first. Um, and then the camera deep dives and the audio deep dive reviews, those are going to be Patreon exclusives. Uh, that community of people are phenomenal for helping to support production. It's, it's pretty awesome. So um, lots, like I said, there was lots of housekeeping. The Pixel 3a Galaxy S10e audio reviews are up. I hope you'll check out that podcast I got to record with my mom. That was just a really special way to celebrate Mother's Day and uh, share some geeky, fun gaming experiences with my mom. Uh, just, again, it stuff is really special, and it's something I hope I can share with my daughter is having a, a passion for this. It's It's just a part of our lifestyle and she's growing up with it in a way that I didn't. So I'll be really excited to see where it goes. Um, and then, uh, just a couple more videos coming out. I'm going to have some fun accessory and production, uh, videos, microphone, uh, reviews coming out very soon. And then, uh, just some more stuff towards, uh, towards content on this channel in general lfa with another super chat uh five bucks more towards a refurbished sputnik for better interwebs i don't know was the oh i didn't even check i didn't have my meter up did did this one actually make it through or was there a lot of stuttering can someone in the live chat just mention real quick was i study stuttering really badly this this week or did it hold up better than it did last week anyone Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? I'm gonna... James Vincent, all fine. Okay, great. So uh, my computer was acting up, but my data connection was good this time. <laughs> I'll just never, I'll never have a week where everything works. It's it's always gonna be me trying to put out fires all the way. So uh, thank, oh, and, and Baxter, uh, Tim Baxter, Junkie, Gary Fleischner. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, a few small hiccups. That's fine. I'm fine with a few small hiccups. I just don't want the, the entire stream to crash entirely. Okay, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for sharing and subscribing. The sharing, it's taking an effort, is, is really, I think, going to be the future of user-generated content. So not just is someone making something cool and you watched it. It's participating, leaving comments, and then actively sharing and joining those conversations uh, again, why I will continue to put out that plea for support over on our glowing rectangles. There are so many voices in our community that really don't get the attention that they deserve. And we can help with that. We can actively participate and we can actively help spread those, those voices out farther and wider than they can on their own. So I hope you'll continue to join me in that initiative just so that we can make sure that this stuff doesn't get too echo chambery. I, I pointed to a number of stories this week where the... 
the ugliest and most insidious aspects of Google popularity, Google search popularity, is actively harming the markets and the gadgets that we care about. So we can help join as a counterbalance conversations that spread that out a bit more and help democratize the conversation a bit more. So I hope you'll join me there. Even for when you disagree with me, we're still sharing and we're still discussing and we're still conversing. And uh, another super chat from Paco Street, <laughs> plus one for Money Island. Um, thank you so much. So folks, uh, I hope you will, you all have a fantastic tech week. I'm going to try and live tweet some of the uh, the OnePlus 7 uh, reveal tomorrow. It's uh, it's May 14th. I don't think I'm going to do a live video or a broadcast on anything there because I don't I don't have the phone. I can't talk about the phone. Um, but I feel like, you know, join me on Twitter and then we can all have a good chuckle or a chortle over what they 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 put out, what we'll get excited about or uh, we can all gasp when the prices are revealed. And oh my gosh, it's going to be more than the cheapest Galaxy S. Oh my gosh. Oh, fan my vapors. Um and then Gary Fleischner with the super chat. Thanks for a great show one. Have a great week everyone. And that's the right note to go out on. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for listening for those of you on the audio podcast. You know where you can find me? I'm going to be back here next Monday for another uh, Monday morning tech chat show. So uh, come join me in the AM Pacific time and I'll catch you all on the next podcast. Be well, have fun with your tech. I love you all. I'll see you on the next. I'll catch you on the next one. <laughs> I fumbled the landing. Totally did not stick the landing. <laughs>